Good afternoon. Welcome to KAUS Live. We're coming to you from KAUS campus uh, in the Winter Enrichment Program. Uh, joining us today is James Line. James, thank you for joining us. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we're, we're discussing human machine future this year as, as the theme of the Winter Enrichment Program. So you're a, you're a great subject to discuss <laughs> that, that topic with. So tell us a little bit about how hacking and how cybersecurity came to be part of your, your job. Well, at a very young age, I started dissecting my computer and, and ripping apart. It was always a, a bit of a natural habit for me to, to break everything, much to the dislike of my parents, given that at a young age, I wasn't particularly good at putting it back together. Mm -hmm. And I very quickly came across the realization that whilst technology could do incredible, powerful things, these, these programs were, were amazing and, and eye-opening, mm. They could also very easily be subverted and that there were overt security failures that someone could take advantage of. Mm -hmm. And thankfully, I got a tap on the shoulder at the right point in my early career to put me towards working with the good guys on finding those flaws and eliminating them to make us all safer. Mm -hmm. you, you have, um, you, your, your numerous TED Talks and things kind of run like a comedy sketch. Uh, <laughs> a very uh, bad comedy sketch. <laughs> cyber security. <laughs> and I love, there's a bit that you do talking about getting those AOL discs in the mail and oh. using them as a coaster and everything else. Yes, those are the days. <laughs> so talk about reverse engineering some of these things and how that helps you uh, in your work today. Well, the goal of offensive security disciplines mm -hmm. is to behave and to think like an attacker. Mm -hmm. And the theory goes that if we can take the skills and practices of, of a cyber criminal, mm -hmm. but apply them with good ethics, we can find those flaws and patch the holes before cyber criminals get the opportunity mm -hmm. uh, to exploit them. So, so that's really what, what I and, and others do day to day in the security industry, ripping apart interesting new technologies, internet connected devices, mobiles, computers, trying to find those flaws mm. and make us all a little bit safer. Um, now, obviously with every new device that we introduce in our life, we introduce 10 or you, you can give the number <laughs> of, of ways that someone can hack us. Talk about how we slow that progression towards the ever increasing availability of our personal data. Well, I, I think you're right. There's, there's some polynomial, potentially exponential increase in, in surface area mm -hmm. occurring. Society's been through a, a fascinating set of transformations of, of connectedness mm -hmm. uh, over the past 30 years, from getting mainstream access to the internet to having you know, regular and constant connectivity with mobile devices. We're at a whole new point of connection with technology mm -hmm. and with each other. That's brought about some amazing revolutions in the personal world and, and in the world of, of business as well, entire new industries. Mm. And we're undergoing another one right now with the Internet of Things, where we're connecting whole new categories of devices. We're just constantly surrounded by technology. Mm. Now, much as the Winter Enrichment Program has many speakers talking about why that's fantastic and all the incredible conveniences or medical advances that come from that, I think we are opening ourselves up to a whole new world of opportunity mm. for cyber criminals to control the physical world from the digital. Mm. So much as it's fantastic, society is entering a new period of potentially heightened vulnerability to cyber criminals. Mm. So as we think about these different devices, I mean, what is it that a cyber criminal is looking to get when they reach through mm. that vulnerability in a way? Well, the, the motives of cyber criminals can be quite varied. Mm but the largest motive overall is undeniably fraud. It's making money. I mean, mm -hmm. over 99% of the malicious code, of the phishing scams, the nasty stuff that you see is about getting to your personal information. Mm -hmm. But they often do that in surprisingly creative ways. There's a, a bit of a, a stereotype amongst many internet users mm -hmm. that they aren't interesting, that a cyber criminal would never bother to target them because there's a much richer person or a much more interesting company to go after. The, the truth is cyber criminals can profit from any individual connected to the internet. Even if you just have an email account, an email account and a password can be sold for a number of dollars by a cyber criminal to another cyber criminal, mm. even without any financial information because it enables them to go and fish or attack 
your family, your friends, your business associates, and that in turn is valuable. Mm. So every one of us has monetary value to cyber criminals, and that's what drives the majority of the market. There are some exceptions. There are nation states, of mm. course, at play, looking to gather intelligence or looking for opportunities to disrupt from healthcare to power, a far more serious space. Uh, and of course, uh, there is corporate espionage as well. Mm. Businesses and organizations looking to steal the intellectual property of others as we connect more and more of our, our business and research world to the internet. Mm. But the grand majority, it's about making money. So, so these guys are wearing hoodies and you can see them on the corner <laughs> passing secrets to each other. I mean, t talk about this market. Where, where are these uh, bits of information being sold? Well, there's the stereotype of, of the hacker in a, in a hoodie, uh -huh. um, which, is, which is a bad stereotype in truth, although a hoodie is very comfortable. Um, today, the majority of criminals are very professional. Mm -hmm. They're very organized. Um, they're far from the, the lone wolf sitting in their mother's basement, uh, as the stereotype goes. There's a section of the internet often kind of referred to as, as the dark web, uh, which really is just a portion of the internet accessed with some specific technologies. Mm. And it's filled with a whole set of websites dedicated to enabling cyber criminals to trade products, tools, and services. And over the past four or five years, I have continued to be just amazed by not just the technical innovation, mm -hmm. but the commercial innovation in this corner of the internet. Mm -hmm. We've seen cyber criminals creating exploit packs, nice web applications that make it point and click easy to generate and deploy malicious code to internet users. We've seen the formation of markets where they sell a, a kind of stock market of credit card information and personal data. Mm -hmm. So your information may be stolen, and depending on whether it's just a username and password, credit card details, or even your identity documents mm -hmm. for anything between kind of two and 40 US dollars equivalent in cryptocurrencies. Mm -hmm. There's digital money laundering, the ability to translate stolen funds and stolen information to tangibles and back to reduce the probability of being tracked. Mm -hmm. It even goes so far as cyber criminals offering a money back guarantee on the effectiveness of their services. So by all accounts, any economist would tell you mm. this is an illicit black market trading products and services mm. with innovation, with competition, a set of cyber criminals behaving professionally to come after you. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that seems uh, like the Amazon of identity theft in a way. And it I'm really wondering is. how on earth can you even start to defend yourself against that? It, it, it really is. I mean, <clears throat> we've actually done work previously. I was on a TV show with a, with a researcher where we went to one of these dark web market sites mm -hmm. and with great legal safeguards working with the police, we actually bought uh, a set of data. And of the 10 records we bought, credit card numbers, um, and enough information to commit fraud, we were able to find nine out of the 10 people, mm. interview them and confirm that the information was theirs mm. and look into how it was stolen. I think there's two high level lessons that anyone using the internet can take away here. The first is assume you're compromised. Mm. Assume that your information has already been lost to one of these sites. You should set up credit file monitoring and you should behave in such a way as, as to think that you're, you're constantly under attack, because you are. The second piece is good basic hygiene and security prevention measures will take you a long way. We've seen, all of us, the constant deluge of data breaches. We're constantly hearing about a new hacked website and new victims. Cybersecurity is a hot topic like never before. Mm. And that's caused a lot of people to throw their hands in the air and say, I can't win. I'm just going to let you know, the government or the network guys deal with this issue. Mm -hmm. If we could get everyone listening to this to follow the top 10 cybersecurity basics, the things you'll find plastered all over the internet that we always talk about, good password security, updating your computer, being on the lookout for scams, offering something a little too good to be true. Mm -hmm. The truth is, we'd actually thwart a great number of these breaches and we'd make life a lot 
harder for cyber criminals. Mm. It doesn't have to be complicated. So, so you spend much of your time sort of disrupting the scams and things that cyber criminals come up with. Has the internet ever uh, confronted you personally? Do you ever? <laughs> yes, <laughs> I've had a number of those occasions. I have, uh -huh. I have been tackled for these, uh, including in, in dark web forums. Um, it, it, it has happened a few times, particularly uh -huh. where we've been successful in, in really identifying the individuals involved in particular cyber criminal gangs. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so it does happen once in a while, yeah. um, but at the end of the day, raising awareness of this topic, helping people understand what they can do to keep themselves safe mm -hmm. is just as valuable a security control as running antivirus, updating your computer and, and the technical things that can be done. Yeah. It's a worthwhile trade-off. Uh, um, so, so, you know, there are obviously a whole ecosystem of professionals whose mm -hmm. job it is to talk to people in organizations about this stuff. So, I mean, how, um, you know, how do they reach people and get past what you often talk about is the, the, the seven-year-old best practice thing that they're clinging onto with their, their cold, lifeless hands? <laughs> how, do, how do you get, bridge that gap with people? Well, for me, there's, there's a couple of, of key tools, and, mm. and, and others may, may do it differently. The, the first is recognizing that a lot of the practices people need at work to protect an organization, to protect the data, are the same things they need to do to protect themselves at home, their friends, their family. Mm -hmm. So talking to that personal security, protecting your finances, your credit card information, your usernames and passwords, your privacy, is a powerful tool to help people stay safe personally and to protect the organization. So that's number one. Mm -hmm. The second thing I found is very effective is showing people how this stuff works. Mm -hmm. Because cybersecurity and the, the notion of hacking can sometimes be this ethereal concept. You've heard about it, it's scary, but you can't relate to it and how easy it might be for the cyber criminals to attack you. Mm. Showing people with live demonstrations the insight into that process, something I'm going to be doing later today, enables them to contextualize how they're attacked and why these pieces of security awareness advice are so important. Mm. that's where you win the victory of enabling that member of society to focus on keeping themselves safe. Mm -hmm. um, is malware and this type of thing, is it a, is it a good idea? Is it something that, that most people should use? Is it a best practice? Well, running security controls to prevent malicious code, I mean, really should be a, a default in this mm. day and age. Mm -hmm. um, and at this point, most people, when it comes to traditional computer, uh, are, are running those defenses. It often comes with the computer uh, mm -hmm. these days and is, is built in. What is interesting is how many people have got used to being targeted on a computer only to have those defenses thwarted on a mobile device. Mm -hmm. So phishing is often more effective on mobiles. People feel immune. I've actually overheard in an office someone say, no, I'm not sure about this link. I'll open it on my iPad. But, sorry, what? <laughs> There's also, on a lot of phones, quite a malicious code problem on, uh, on mobile devices as well now. Mm -hmm. I actually recently did a demonstration uh, where we got 10 people in a coffee shop to play with their phones, mm -hmm. and we successfully attacked nine out of 10 of them to take over their mobile devices. Mm -hmm. And the reaction was consistent from each of them. I didn't know I needed to worry about security on my mobile device. Mm. Having a PIN code was as far as they got. They just didn't worry about updating it and running security software like their traditional PC. Mm. But attackers are experts at going for those weak spots mm. and mobile devices have become a central interest. Yeah. Uh, you, you spoke a little bit about IoT, Internet of Things. Mm. Talk about the most fun slash ridiculous things <laughs> that are coming from that a uh, bit of your research? Well, uh, about three years ago, we started this Internet of Things hacking project, mm -hmm. and, and we're still going. We're still finding new, bizarre IoT devices. Mm -hmm. Some of them are very sensible. CCTV cameras, webcams, baby monitors, um, Wi-Fi power devices, so you can turn things on and off, uh, like heaters or, or you know, your games console. Others are just wacky. Wi-Fi hairbrushes and toothbrushes. Um, <laughs> I think one of my favorites is one that I found about two and a half years ago. Mm. It's an Internet of Things connected plant watering device. 
and it enables you to, when you're away, water your plant. As you do. Yeah. As you do. Yeah. And it comes with a webcam, so you can watch the plant being planty. Yes. And it's got this, it's really weird, this rubberized hand ah. that you can use to kind of stroke the plant, <laughs> because I guess they like that, I don't know. Um, I mean, just all manner of really, really strange devices. Uh, that one was particularly fun because uh, you could force it to water forever. So you could flood things. Uh, Internet of Things connected crock pots. Um, I recently used an Internet of Things connected coffee pot mm. to get inside a network and attack a computer to steal banking information. Mm. So just a, a huge number of bizarre devices, invariably with, with quite poor security. So, so what you're saying is these uh, sort of lesser things, my Wi-Fi toaster, yes. could be the gateway to getting to a computer on that network. Well, that, that's right. I mean, these devices are sat inside your network, inside that, that bubble mm -hmm. of security. And if they expose themselves to the internet, as, as many do by default without you even doing any work, mm -hmm. and they're vulnerable, they can be a pivot to the inside trusted zone of your network mm -hmm that can enable the attackers either to get in to attack other devices, or they could use that device to attack other locations, mm. making you complicit in the crime. Mm. They could use your toaster as part of launching an attack against a major online service. Mm -hmm. And this isn't theory, it, it's happened. Mm. Uh, in fact, a major uh, infrastructure component, a, a DNS provider that provides services to huge social media platforms like Twitter mm. was attacked by and large by internet connected CCTV cameras and digital video recorders. And these devices all over the world were used to rally up a huge attack, one of the largest we've ever seen, mm -hmm. uh, that took some of these major providers offline. So these devices aren't just a, a, a black box piece of technology. Mm -hmm. Your kettle, your toaster is a computer mm -hmm. and it can have very much the same flaws you'd attribute to the traditional laptop you might be using right now. Right. Any other uh, funny things that you've seen with these CCTV uh, cameras? Well, it's very common for them to have hideous default passwords, mm. um, often that people don't change. Mm. Uh, we've seen a couple of CCTV manufacturers where if you change the password, the original factory default password still works, which is just an unbelievably terrible implementation. Uh, at one point, uh, we found a manufacturer uh, with over 570,000 cameras connected to the internet announcing themselves where you could log in basically without a username and password. Right. And that, of course, presents an opportunity to attack the network, mm. but also enables you to get your eyes into some fairly scary places that, that represent physical or, or privacy threats. Mm. Many of them come with cameras and microphone functionality. <laughs> so you could listen in to a conversation that, that someone is having. Mm -hmm. And just, just think about that. In your home, in your child's nursery, in a school, the, these places could be exposed to, to constant monitoring from, from unsavory characters. Mm -hmm. That's the new level of exposure, that new opportunity for cyber criminals from the digital world to gain access to the physical. And that wasn't there 10 years ago. Right. Um, talking about this stuff has become your public uh, profile, <laughs> yes. and it's brought you into some interesting places, including uh, Bill Maher and uh, some other places. Talk a little bit about how this type of notoriety has, has changed your professional life. Yeah, I, I mean, I started out as a very introverted geek, mm -hmm. sitting and playing with you know interesting code and trying to build security platforms and reverse engineering. But I realized early on in my career that you know, building awareness of these issues, showing people how it worked was, was really important. Mm -hmm. So I started presenting and, and doing media work. Um, oh, they were some awful presentations. Some of the early ones were really, really painful. And mm -hmm. I like to think I've got a bit better over the years. Just a tad. But through doing that, I've ended up in some really bizarre places. Mm -hmm. on, on Bill Maher, it's a very strange and surreal experience to walk out onto a talk show being watched by 30 million people and be sat down next to Snoop Dogg 
um, to talk about cybersecurity. Yeah. Um, I've, I've sat you know, in an audience next to Cameron Diaz and helped to secure our iPhone and, <laughs> and worked with a lot of, of celebrities who, of course, have, have huge problems with this, this stuff as well. Mm -hmm. Over the past few years, my focus has shifted a little bit again. Mm. I still try to raise awareness of, of security like this. But now my focus is building that next generation of security professionals. Mm. Um, I still do a lot of hands-on technical work, but I'm old, right? There's a need for a new generation of technology users, a fay with all these great new gadgets. Mm -hmm. And I've really focused on building cybersecurity games, hacking challenges, to find that next generation of talent, mm. to raise them up to be society's new defenders mm -hmm. as we embrace all this technology. So that's one of the key reasons I'm here. I'm really hopeful that as people listen to these talks, they listen to this interview, they think, that sounds like a really interesting mm. job. Maybe I'd like to get into cybersecurity research as well. And, and what is, in your view, uh, the, the, the path to that? Well, I think the, the paths are diverse. Mm -hmm. um, there's not one size fits all in terms of how you come to the industry or the resulting professions. Mm -hmm. There are people that work on forensics, you know, reconstructing digital crimes, helping the police to understand a fraud case and to make sure that the people responsible are, are put in jail. Mm -hmm. There are offensive security roles, hacking into a bank with their permission to find flaws and prevent the criminals being able to do the same. Mm -hmm. There are jobs being able to communicate cybersecurity threats and research within a business, helping translate technical subject matter to, to everyone out there. Building defensible applications that are more secure by default. Building that next IoT device, the internet plant watering device, except with better security. So I think the cybersecurity roles are far reaching across technology in, in many different sizes. It could be through university. You could study um, computer engineering, computer science, or, or cybersecurity. Uh, for many, this can be a hobbyist discipline mm. where you get into this because it's, it's fun and engaging. That, that's where I started, mm. you know, reverse engineering because I was interested in this stuff. I think 99% of the battle here is making people realize this is a job, it's a profession you can have, it's really great fun, mm and encouraging them to, to go and pursue it in any of those guises. Very cool, very cool. We're gonna see if, uh, do we have any questions from our online audience or from our physical audience here? So we do actually have one um, from uh, Abdelaziz, who is reaching out to us from Nigeria. What's your, what's your bank account number? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Abdelaziz is asking, what is best practice when it comes to interacting with um, online merchants? doing cyber commerce, um, what are practices that users should, should employ to remain safe? Excellent question. So to name but a few, um, this is an area that is often oversimplified. Uh, people will say, well, look for the padlock you know, in, the, uh, in the address bar there. That used to be quite good advice. Uh, you'd look for you know, a trusted website address with the padlock. Unfortunately, today, cyber criminals have gotten into the business of deploying certificates and they have their own padlock. Uh, so you can very securely hand away your information to a scammer by seeing that icon. The best advice is try and deal with trusted and authoritable sources. Deal with known stores. Check your spelling. Lots of cyber criminals will register domain names, addresses that are really close to the trusted one you expected. So just like you'd make sure that you're calling the right telephone number if you were calling a store before you hand over information, do the same with the website address. Make sure you're using a computer that's up to date, running the latest security software. Good websites sometimes get compromised. In fact, over 80% of malicious code on the internet is distributed from small businesses that have had their website hacked. So you could be on a good web page but if you're running out of date software in the background silently whilst you're buying a product from a good company, you could be being attacked. So it's really important to worry about your own security whilst you're dealing with that merchant. Make sure that you're using a credit card rather than a debit card and one that has suitable insurance. A lot of debit cards around the world aren't indemnified 
against loss. If you're really worried about security, it's a great idea to have a credit card for online transactions only with a very limited credit amount. That means if your information goes missing, the damage that can be done is, is restricted and it's very easy to replace that uh, to get another one to use for, for online services. Also, um, with, uh, with each of these online retailers, just do a little check out of their, their reputation before you, you transact with them. Mm. If you're dealing with one of the huge companies that has good security policies, good security practices themselves, you're all the more likely to not fall victim to attack. And dealing with reputation is really an extension of, of what we do in the physical world. There, there are lots of other things that I could tell you, but th those are the major ones. Uh, and dealing with a trusted brand uh, is really a good starting point. You, you, you talk quite often about how hackers and cyber criminals are really quite meticulous because they have to be, because the, the water they're swimming in is much more dangerous. I mean, can't you in a way try to live like a cyber criminal in, in the way that you verify and, and only trust certain things? Yeah, I mean, I, I would encourage more lying on the internet and more suspicion, which sounds like a really weird thing to say in general society. I want you to be less trusting and I want you to be less trustworthy. But the truth is that's a really great practice. When we're dealing with a company asking for data, mm. ask yourself, do they need that information? Does I, do I need to provide that particular company with my real date of birth? Mm -hmm. If you don't, lie. Because if they lose that information, if they're compromised, actual data about you isn't circulated. So you try and limit the surface area by only providing the data that you have to to these various, these various locations. As to living like a cyber criminal, um, we, we should be a little more suspicious. I mean, here's a great example. Almost everyone watching will have received at some point an email from a Nigerian prince who promises to give them millions of dollars if they could just go through a simple set of steps. How many times have you seen that email? And how many times in the physical world has a Nigerian prince come up to you and actually offered you millions of dollars? It just doesn't happen. If something seems too good to be true, mm -hmm. it almost always is. Right. Apply some of those scrutinies of real life to the digital world. If something says you won the lottery and you didn't buy a ticket, mm -hmm. yeah, something's probably wrong try and apply a little bit of second check. And if you aren't sure, ask an expert. If you get an email from your bank that claims there's been a security breach, rather than immediately actioning the email, out of band, call your bank directly. A little bit of common sense here is gonna help you stay safe. Um, you know, Nigeria is taking a bit of a beating here. So yes, um, it's not just them. Yeah, they're <laughs> well, the stereotype. <laughs> and, and so there's the question. I mean, where um, are these cyber attacks coming from? Um, you know, regionally, is it completely all over the globe? Are there places known for this? Uh, is that in and of itself a tip off to people? Well, well it's often a Nigerian prince in these emails, mm. but often it doesn't come from Nigeria. Uh, it could be from many other, many other countries. There are certainly stereotype locations. Mm. It is fair to say that there is significant cyber criminal infrastructure in Russia, in China, in Eastern Europe. The truth is it's everywhere. The internet is flat, it's borderless, we are interconnected with everywhere else, and it's very easy for cyber criminals to remain anonymous. Mm. That means that someone living a short distance from me in the UK could be running their infrastructure in Russia, proxying through a florist in San Francisco to be able to attack a, a, a system here where we sit now. That flat interconnected nature represents a huge challenge because laws and mitigations are often national mm. where the internet is borderless. So yes, there are some stereotypes, but they really don't help us. This mm. is an international problem that impacts everyone. Um, you're an international traveler, and, and as are uh, pretty much as is everyone here at, at Kaust. Mm. So if I head out the door, uh, I'm going to fly through Frankfurt, I'm going to end up in New York and do whatever else. What are the, the basic couple of things I should do 
uh, to secure myself that little bit more through international airports, cafes, hotels, that sort of thing. Well, there's some really boring ones, mm -hmm. and it, they don't sound exciting at all, but they really make a difference. I mean, updating your web browser, updating your computer, running the latest software mm -hmm. really does help. If you join a rogue Wi-Fi hotspot, someone set one up to snare victims, if you're running older software, without you doing anything wrong, they can deploy malicious code to your computer in the background. So updating is a security control. Mm. Next, as you're kind of visiting these various locations, if you can, try to avoid using unknown wireless hotspots. Try to avoid handing over data just because someone offers you free internet mm -hmm. doesn't mean you should be giving a username and password. I actually ran a study um, in a couple of airports where I set up a free public Wi-Fi <laughs> network and people had to register and provide their personal information to get free access to the internet. And within a couple of hours, hundreds of people gave me their credit card information and thousands of people a username and password. How many of them use the same username and password across multiple sites and services? Well, for legal reasons, we can't check that. Anecdotally, probably quite a few. <laughs> so just be a little careful about what you connect to. Use uh -huh. data if you can. If you are going to provide information to access one of these Wi-Fi hotspots, lie through your teeth, if possible, to avoid spreading around your personal information. And consider the use of uh, encrypted services uh, to make sure that your information isn't being casually leaked. Mm. It's not clever or exciting. It's right. the normal top 10 things. You'll find a security best practice here from KAUST and here from, from most other organizations on the planet. So, so what I've heard is that Wi-Fi is like the free food of the internet. If you <laughs> What could possibly there? go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Do we have any other questions? Uh, we do, actually. Um, Selma is curious about how we can best secure websites against cyber attacks. Ah, that's a good one. So I, I did mention that a very large percentage, over 80% of malicious code is distributed via compromised websites. Mm -hmm. Very often people develop websites using outdated security practices. They rapidly crank out some code or they copy and paste from websites on the internet and publish what seems to work. We find thousands and thousands of websites every day from small businesses to individuals that are running really outdated software. Mm. Content management systems like WordPress or Joomla, which are fine and reasonable things to use, but if you never update them, mm. your website becomes vulnerable. So again, I don't want to sound like a broken <laughs> record, but updates are important, not just on your computer, but on your website, on your web server as well. Uh -huh. If you're a small business or if you're building a research page and you're working with someone else to build that code, you could look up something like the OWASP Top 10. That's a set of 10 practices for programming websites, things to keep in mind to eliminate common attacks. None of them are actually that difficult to implement. It just requires a bit of upfront consideration. And the truth is in many cases where these web applications are built, they're built for functionality and securities and afterthought. Mm. Go look up that top 10, follow the best practice, and in most cases, you're gonna avoid becoming one of those tens of thousands of websites every day that, that distribute malicious code. Mm. One last tiny piece of advice on websites. Backup. It has been over the past couple of years common mm. for sites to be compromised with malicious code. In some cases, to be compromised and held to ransom. So they encrypt all of the files. If you have a backup, it's easy to restore, to undo the damage, to get up and running again quickly, mm -hmm. and to make sure that you eliminate that mechanism the cyber criminal used to get in. Mm -hmm. Basically all the things we tell you to do on your personal computer, you should be thinking about on your website as well. So should you not go and put your information into Aunt May's doilies and make <laughs> that order? Should you more, I mean, should this really start to change people's user uh, decisions a little bit only to buy from larger retailers? Or I, I do. Well, I, I think it's, it's very much like the physical world. People feel safer dealing with larger retailers mm -hmm. because they're likely to have checks and balances uh, to, to prevent these breaches. Mm -hmm. 
Sometimes that's not true. There have been some large retailers who've been shown to have poor practice. Mm -hmm. Small businesses are more than capable of having good defenses here also. Um, and you can build up a, a spider sense of trustworthiness if they're using a trusted payment processor, if they've made sure that their entire website is encrypted, mm. if they have a policy that outlines how they test their site. These are things that can help build up your, your confidence. But if you're not sure and you still want to go ahead with the purchase, consider use of a, a temporary credit card where at least the damage can be limited if things go wrong. Mm. Very good. Any, any other questions? Uh, we have one more, actually. This is coming from uh, Daniel mm -hmm. online. Uh, Daniel said that uh, since you mentioned that uh, the Internet of Things is not secure, mm. should we simply avoid them? Should we simply avoid it as much as possible? <laughs> I mean, the, the, the truth is with the Internet of Things at the moment, your chances of jumping up and down on a landmine when you, build, when you buy one of these products is really high. There are more bad IoT products than there are good. And they're not all bad. There are some vendors that have done a really good job of worrying about security. Mm. There can be other dimensions, though, to the question of whether you should use these devices. For example, some of the, the home products that sit and listen as an assistant are very, very secure. They encrypt your information. They've got defenses against exploitation. They're really hard to hack but they also listen to you constantly in your home or your bedroom. You may not be comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. So there's a privacy question, a policy question about your data that you should consider before you use these devices, as well as a security question. Mm -hmm. What I would be very cautious of right now is cheap Internet of Things products. The majority of, of cameras and webcams that are low cost are horribly secured. They send security from a PC back 10 to 15 years in maturity. They're awful. And they offer no updates and no promise of security going forwards. I think when it comes to general IoT product attitude, you should ask yourself very seriously, if the risk is so high right now, do I need this product in my life? Do I want to buy this Wi-Fi connected kids toy that my kids are going to play with and might be compromised? Mm. Or should I wait a year or two whilst the world sorts these problems out? I would be tempted to slow down my adoption, mm. except in the case of high quality products or products that have been vetted from a security perspective. Exercise a little caution. Right, right. Very good. Any others? That's it. Well, James, thank you so much for joining us. That's uh, been a pleasure. I feel like there, there wasn't nearly enough time to cover all of the, <laughs> the, the questions that we would have. Um, but best of luck with your, your keynote this evening. Really looking forward to it. I'm sure there'll be lots of great questions there as well. Absolutely, yeah. And thank you to our online audience for your questions. Uh, you can join us back here tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Uh, and thank you. That's all for this afternoon.